Um, Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Hillary Gardner. I graduated from ILR in 2006. I am thrilled to have Al Davidoff here to talk about his new book, really just recently came out, Unionizing the Ivory Tower. And this was so interesting. I mean, what could be more ILR than ILR student organizing a union at while a, while a student at Cornell working as a janitor and all about the trajectory of the union and his work? Great. Welcome, Al. Um, before we start, I also wanted to mention that we are in book club in partnership with the Alumni Association Labor Affinity Group. And we have two people here I would like to introduce and have them introduce themselves as well. We have Rich Edelman and Rob Malosky. Hi, Hi there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rich Edelman, um, class of 75, and I'm an attorney who represents uh, transportation unions uh, through at a law firm, uh, in particular railroad unions, so I was busy a year ago. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Robert and uh, Andrew Crook and I are co-coordinators for the Alumni Labor Rights and Social Justice Affinity Group, and um, We've put on a number of Zoom meetings because obviously our folks are spread across the country where we brought in speakers. And as I mentioned, we were thinking of asking Al to do this, but Hillary already got ahead of us. So we're doing this together. And uh, I would encourage anybody who's interested to you know, join up, do events with a labor rights social justice group. And we are glad to take suggestions for programs. Um, one program we had a little while ago was Professor Rose Bott who participated in a, in a uh, short film about a private equity takeover of a company in Wisconsin. And we put that out, showed the video, and then had discussions. So uh, we'd be glad to have anybody, you know, want to join and come up with ideas. Robert, I don't know if you want to say anything. No, uh, Rich, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Hillary. And um, I'm Robert Malofsky, class of 72. Um, and I'm former general counsel of the Amalgamated Transit Union. I retired a year or two ago. And, um, and I currently uh, work with Rich and Andrew on the uh, labor rights programming. And um, I also teach for the DC, um, the ILR DC credit internship program. It's uh, ironically, a, a course on how Congress works, which has been hysterical <laughs> this year. So um, anyway, welcome all and um, thank you again Al, for being here with us. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Great, so as more people join us, if you want, put your name in the chat and say, hi, where you're joining from. Great, so let's start, Al. Um, excited to have you introduce yourself and you we had talked about you know it's okay you joined you didn't make it all the way through the book or you're excited to start soon um so I'll take us through a little bit uh you know the book's about and he has a five minute excerpt he can read too which I'm excited to hear in his own words great well thank you Hillary and thanks everybody for uh depending on your location being here uh, on an evening or late afternoon. Um, uh, and it's great to see some familiar faces and names I haven't seen in a, in a while. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a little bit of background about sort of how this came to be and, and what I think this, this story is, assuming some of you may have read some of it, some non, not any of it, and hopefully a few of you, all of it. Um, so, um, you know, the personal story here is, you know, I, I was uh, a student. Um, I got, I became a student activist um, because of things that were happening on campus back then. Um, efforts to try to increase the amount of labor activity and presence in the school, uh, the uh, divestment movement, anti-apartheid uh, movement, and um, and then I, I got involved in a few local labor things going on. Um, but a, as the book describes, I, I happened to also be there at a time when a group of workers on campus began to talk about um, issues that were facing them. And for quite a while, um, th this group never uttered the word union, not, not once. Um, I 
volunteered with the group, um, really found uh, a group of people that I really liked and respected. And um, uh, a as things evolved, it was a really sort of just kind of incredible coincidence, which is that one of the fruits of our student efforts uh, had led to a very um, remarkable uh, recently retired UAW uh, leader and high level staffer, a guy named Brendan Sexton, coming to teach two credit classes uh, on campus. And uh, he, ha he happened to be there when things were beginning to unfold with uh, staff on campus. And so, um, I uh, got so caught up in this that in my senior year, I ended up taking a job as a custodian. Um, and um, uh, as the, the kind of rump effort to um, come together, which was not in the context of a union drive, emerged into um, becoming an organizing drive, um, I... Uh, felt that this was kind of an, you know, an incredible struggle. And for all of us who spent years on campus, um, you know, a university is a very hierarchical place. And um, it's pretty clear that if you're a food service worker or a custodian or a bus driver, you're not really in the middle or near the top of that hierarchy. And so to see a group of folks stepping up uh, with a lot of fear, a lot to lose, um, frankly, there were a, a, many ways a lot like the neighbor, the workers and the people in the neighborhood I grew up in. And I, I felt um, a real connection and affinity to that group. And so I, I stayed with it. And um, I, I ended up due to really um, sort of a political fluke that uh, I describe in the book, ended up getting elected president of the local when I was about 23. And so the, that couple of years, and then I stayed with it for a long time because I I realized how hard it was to build a good local union, and all of my idealism and politics and hopes, um, you know, had to contend with the realities. and And so the book is really a sort of story of building an organization at the grassroots, and really kind of a trial and error story. Um, uh, and I would say. Um, it's really four kinds of stories. It's a Cornell story for sure. Um, so, you know, for those of us who have our own history and, and you know, um, important relationships to that history and that institution, it's an important Cornell story. Um, it's really also an Ithaca Tompkins County story because as, as you see, as the story unfolds, part of the lessons we were learning was that we had to be more tied to the community, that our, our issues were the same in many respects as the communities, that there was, um, um, there were things in terms of the university's impact with staff and community that were really things that we had in common. And, and we lived in the community. We, our, our identities didn't end after we punched out. Um, so whether there was good housing or not, or um, other opportunities mattered. So it's a really also an, an Ithaca story. Um, I don't know if they do it anymore, but years and years ago, the Ithaca Journal around New Year's would run a, I think it was top 10 stories of the year for the you know community. And I think there were two years where they, described these struggles as the most important story in the community. They weren't doing it from a particularly supportive point of view. Um, the Daily Sun was more supportive. But this was a major um, period of time in terms of the community. And frankly, the, the local union became an engine that rebuilt the local labor movement, the labor federation, and, and in, reinvigorated a kind of progressive politics ties to um, the black community, the LGBTQ community. Um, and so it's sort of also a community and an Ithaca story. Third, um, it's what I said before, it's a, it's a, I don't, I haven't really read anything that takes you from a very grassroots perspective, really bottom up through the, all the chronology of building a, a, a local union. There's a lot of great stuff that's been written more analytically from a you know ten thousand feet about what we should do and what's important to the labor movement. 
Um, um, but uh, I thought that that trying to tell the story, and it's just one story uh, uh, of the struggles of building a local um, uh, was important. And then lastly, in, in terms of the here and now, um, I think it's also a story about the dynamics of what is going on with the uh, white working class right now. And um, if you looked just at the demographics of the thousand or so service and maintenance workers, um, it's about 90% white, rural, socially conservative, you know, a generation or two from, you know, farm um, families, majority of the unit Republican, not not ideological, but, you know, conservative, very little union orientation or connection. Those demographics map pretty closely to um, the stereotype of who has become manipulated into a kind of mega frenzy, uh, you know, fearing the other, fearing uh, people different than you, um, you know, uh, scapegoating. And yet, the, this is a group of people that became um, quite politically progressive while remaining completely who they were in their, you know, um, identities. I mean, this is a local where on hunting season, I, you would joke, that's the one meeting of the year I chaired where no one could sit behind me because people were showing off their hunting rifles. It didn't like the idea of people sitting behind me with a gun. Um, so it, to me, it's it, in this moment where there are real, you know, debates about what has happened to the sort of white working class, particularly sort of the lower white working class. To me, this is an interesting story that provides some uh, bit of uh, antidote to some of that um, sense of that this group has somehow become irredeemable, um, uh, which to me is quite far from the truth. Um, so um, that's probably enough background. I wanna make sure, I mean, it's a nice size group. I wanna make sure people have a chance to ask questions, make comments for people who, who have thoughts they wanna share. Um, I'll read, it'll take five minutes. I'll read one um, segment. For the first time I had to do this, I, I thought long and hard, like, is there a section that would give people a sort of a summary and there really isn't. So I honestly, I've gone to the other end of the spectrum. This is this gives you more of a feel for the story than a summary of the story. It's essentially one moment in the struggle that I, I think conveys um, some something important. A tiny bit of background, and then I'll dive right in. Um, uh, so the way things work. Um, uh, there were a couple times a year where workers would get laid off, This uh, certain workers. Um, in the summers, a lot of dining workers would get laid off, and sometimes at winter break. Um, and uh, it, it, there was no eligibility for unemployment. Um, uh, we came to realize that the university was self-insured for unemployment, so this was a sort of dollar-for-dollar dollar issue uh, every, people were um even if they worked 12 months a year were at this point really making wages below the poverty level and if you, that was cut back to 11 months a year or 10 and a half months or nine months it, it was really devastating and one year um the layoffs in the summer were going to be worse than ever and and that had to do with a part of the construction boom going on on campus that um meant that dorms weren't available for summer programs. And so people were really upset. And we called a meeting, and this is where I'll, I'll read from the book. We called a meeting um, with management uh, about this issue. Um, and I, I'm gonna refer to a, 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 the HR labor relations director, a guy named Pete Tufford. Um, so you'll, you'll hear me use the name Pete. So um, they expected, a meeting where it'd probably be myself and the half dozen stewards from dining. We organized every dining worker we could and about 60 very frustrated about to be laid off workers jammed the meeting room. A few of us had arrived early and took the side of the table by the door. 
This meant management sat across from us facing the door with a table between us. We asked the dining workers to show up 10 minutes later. And as they trickled in, awkwardly filling the room, first standing behind us, then as the space jammed standing behind management, Pete shot me a nasty look, shaking his head in disbelief. He asked me to talk to him outside for one minute. We walked into the hall and he was, he was upset. You set me up. How can you work out problems if I can't trust you? I'm sorry, Pete, I said, but we've been asking for this change for years. The layoffs are even worse this year and folks are really upset. We thought it was important for you all to hear that. You lied to me, Al, he replied. If I told you 60 dining workers were coming, would you have done the meeting? Let's get back in the room. Today, all you have to do is listen. If you cancel the meeting and walk out, that looks even worse for you. I started moving back toward the room. I didn't want our members waiting on this sidebar. Pete wasn't a fighter. He, uh, as an aside, he was an all-American hockey player. In hockey, he was a skillful skater and scorer, not a bruiser. He sat back down, gathered himself and said, well, if we had known so many of you were coming, we'd have gotten a bigger room. I took over from there and explained that we had had it with the poverty caused by this system. I said, our first choice was work, but if there was no work, these dining workers should be eligible for unemployment insurance. Cornell is basically profiting from a loophole in the state law. Every dollar you keep is a dollar that should be feeding these folks and their families. The room was getting physically hot. It was severely cramped. Workers coming off shifts in sweaty uniforms and smelling of grease and food were standing shoulder to shoulder, hovering behind and looming over their bosses. Management could not have gotten out if they wanted to. Then I asked the members to speak to the impact. The anger boiled over. Worker after worker talked about what their summer was going to be like. Their kids were not able to go to camps. The shame they felt not to, uh, to not be able to pay for their children's uniforms to join a baseball league. One member glared right at the head of Cornell Dining and said, you don't know what that's like, do you? It was not a rhetorical question and he asked again in a loud, agitated and fast becoming intimidating tone, do you? The director of the university's prestigious dining program dressed in a suit and tie, a guy we had found arrogant and haughty at grievances and the bargaining table looked down at his hands and said, no, I don't. A couple of workers cried as they spoke about how the quality of what their family ate declined during the layoffs and one gigantic seething short order cook shouted, this just isn't right. Some of us have been here decades. How can Cornell care so goddamn little for us? Folks were nodding, getting more and more furious. There was something between a French Revolution and a Lord of the Flies mood brewing. It was not a stretch for management to fear for their safety. Pete tried to settle things down, but the moment was not his to control. It was one of the few times I felt I might not be able to manage the dynamic. The musicians had overrun the orchestra conductor, and then I thought, so what? What are you going to do about this? I jumped in after 45 minutes of nonstop emotional testimony. Are you asking us to pay you for doing nothing, asked Pete. This was a rough ploy for our stoic, self-sustaining, high work ethic members. We aren't asking for a handout. Give us work, yelled one dining janitor in the room. Now an organism coiled around management's bodies like a boa constrictor seethed. Yes, give us work. I didn't like this direction because I thought it got Cornell off the hook. They should simply pay the unemployment insurance in one form or another. But the members were proud and sensitive to the argument that they just wanted a handout. At some point, I could feel the mood change. It had been emotionally exhausting for everyone in the room. Management looked guilt-ridden and terrified, and the workers were feeling spent. I summed it up. We need a solution, and we will not stop till something better is done. Either find folks work or stop avoiding unemployment insurance. The meeting ended. Workers needed to head home. And as soon as management had enough space to make a beeline for the door, they got out of there. There was a rawness and a proximity to physical danger during that confrontation that reminded me that our members suffering was physical. That as militantly as we expressed ourselves beneath our strong words, 
were a pain and an anger that were what revolutions actually were made of. I know every manager in the room was shaken. The workers that participated shared two feelings with me afterward, pride for quote, getting in their face, but also despair that nothing would be done, that management promised nothing. So um, yeah, that happened. <laughs> And then what? <laughs> and then what? Yeah, keep going. That's very emotional. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing it. I bet anyone who didn't finish yet is going to get this book or didn't say yet. People will read the book. So it's that it does, I feel like, give representative excerpt of the dynamic and the emotions at play. Um, if so we have a small group, like, please, anyone. Can, please feel free to jump in with questions. You can write them in the chat or I think there's a way to raise your hand and then that can um, be a good way. I have questions too. So I will kick it off. I have some questions about your, how did this become a book? Obviously this is your story, but where did it go from, you know, just being your story to getting it, getting down on paper. And if you can speak to your writing process and we'll start there backing it up and get more into the, substance of the book okay and, and it's and it's great seeing, seeing some, some names of folks i haven't seen in a long time um i mean just to say what happened at the end of that um um and i i i use it as an example of what often happened which is you know um most struggles don't result in a you know slam dunk victory where everything goes your way there are there are you know some of those moments and there are flat out failures too and this was kind of an example of so what did happen is the university did not capitulate about the issue of 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 the unemployment and they have not to this day um but they took a very different approach to finding work that summer and while it was not uh, it was far from perfect. Um, they agreed to do like a full court press to try to find as many jobs for as many people as possible. And, and that, I think it's complicated because the university is very decentralized. You can get some understanding with HR or even Day Hall, but then you've got uh, you know 50 departments that tend to go their own way. But I would say probably half the layoffs were eliminated because of that those efforts and so you know people um people knew that change happened because of that meeting i think one of the themes in the book is that people because they were involved at such a high level there was a a pretty continuous sense of ownership of the results and i think for everybody who was in that meeting while people were still frustrated that there were still layoffs, which had happened every summer, the the dramatic increase in the layoffs was sort of staunched by a significant effort. So it was a it was a partial win and a partial loss, but change happened. If that if that meeting hadn't happened, if we had had six stewards there with me, there would have been 60 or 70 dining workers without jobs that summer who got jobs that summer. So that that that's the, the end of that story. I mean, the the book process, I mean, you know, here here's my pitch for you to to if you haven't read it, to read it. it I was joking before everybody got on. It's like a radical labor beach read. It's not a it's not a pedantic uh, textbook. It, and I originally tried to write this a long time ago as a novel. Because I thought that, you know, I thought that the people that I'd gotten to know and work with were so incredible and so vivid, and there were so many great stories. Um, and I had some, you know, dream aspiration that I could, you know, as, use this as a basis for a novel. And I started to write it that way, um, pretty close to the truth, but not completely. Um, and then I began to circulate it a little bit. And I got the same feedback <laughs> consistently, which is, this is a really interesting story. Stop messing around with the novel idea and just write the story. 
and I was, you know, this is a long time ago and I got disheartened. And at that point, you know, my kids were little and I, I was busy and I thought, eh, nobody wants my novel. <laughs> and, um, and I came back to it during the pandemic. I had friends, a couple of things happened. I had some friends who had read it say, you really need to finish that. And then frankly, um, some of the people who were really heroic um, activists and leaders were starting to, to pass on, were starting to die. And it pained me every time I heard that, um, that, uh, that something was getting lost, that their story was, was getting lost. And I, my first intervention was um, I, I convinced the ILR school to open up a, an, like an oral history archive. And so we were able to get some people to come in and share their their stories. And then I kind of, whatever, kicked myself into gear during the pandemic and just wrote the rest of it then. I knew I knew two things for sure. I knew um, that this was a good set of stories. I was really confident about that. And I knew that there were, from having spent the rest of my life trying to you know, work in the labor movement, I knew there were lessons in here that that were useful and things I've drawn on and everything I've done since then. What I didn't know is if I could write it. I, I really, I, I didn't know if I could write it or, or not. And that's, you know, that's for others to judge, but I knew the story was really good. And I knew that there was, there were useful lessons there to be had. That's great. Well, you have a number of alumni authors and people, you know, contact me about the book club. Like, well, could you talk about your process or like, how did you, um, did you, you know, how did you get yourself to sit down and write it basically? I mean, I, um, I basically every weekend I, I worked on it. Um, and I, um, I, I had already sketched out a lot and you know this was a long time ago it's 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 a fascinating experience about memory um and i thought a lot about why why is my mem memory so vivid of something so long ago i've been involved in a hundred other labor struggles and probably 98 of them that are more recent that i could not capture this level of specificity um and I think it's a couple of reasons. Um, one is once you immerse yourself in something, other things come back to you. You talk to other people, they remind you. I went back and looked at newspapers and the internal union publication. So you get immersed in it and then one thing leads to another. Maybe there's something about when you're young, the memories like really embed in a certain way. And maybe it's because they were so important and formative and, and at the time. But I, I can remember literally who said what at some of these sessions in ways that I couldn't tell you something I did six months ago. What has been the feedback from those quoted? Have you, did you check with people you were quoting? Did it be, I mean, or are the quotes literal from the newspaper or from other sorts, any minutes uh, or, you know, the arbitration or is it kind of free form as, as you remember? It's, it's sort of all all of all of the above of what you, what you just said. Um, when I was first messing around with this, I um, I had I had uh, started a job where I needed to drive a lot, and I I you know back in the day tape recorded my my memory. Like I just tried to dredge up everything I could and go through each of these things. So I had some much more recent material you know closer to when things happen to draw on um and i and i did you know talk to a number of people and and like i said i was very surprised at how much what it it churned up um i mean you know the, the, what i read is an example of that like uh, even reading it to you i can i can picture pete coming out in the hall what he said what he said when we went back in i remember I don't I don't remember all the names of who said what, you know, so um, there are instances where I don't put the, I don't put the person's name down because I wasn't sure. Interesting. 
Excellent. So, let's, so we could continue to talk about the process, but to, but to, talking about you know the substance, I had I was very interested being like a student, and that you know it's our alumni book club about the interaction with students, and that you know you started as a student, and even it just in the initial chapters where you do start working as the custodian, like the di the dichotomy of you know these fancy cars and people trashing the bathroom, and but then you you know marshalling, like getting this, working with the student activists. I thought it was very, very interesting. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that and if you could speak to, you know, how things may have changed since the 80s, like in terms of student activism or, you know, the privilege that could exist at the school and the dynamic between um, the like town and gown, as it's called. Gosh, I don't know. Um, uh... One of the things I find kind of funny is that, um, yeah, I've done, I've, I've been immersed in a lot of great fights and great organizations my whole life. And um, once you write a book, people ask you questions about all sorts of things. <laughs> they assume you have something to contribute on. It's funny how that how that goes. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'll, this is a little indirect. I mean, in terms of now, um, I mean, I think we're in a really exciting time in terms of young people. I, I feel a great deal of of hope. Um, I think I, I'm I'm teaching a seven week class at ILR. I haven't done anything like this before. I've been immersed in in you know union leadership development, you know, uh, adults and activists and leaders, but I haven't been with a group, you know, like uh, like this. And you know, there's just Young people are are engaged in a wide range of movements. Uh, the, the you know the labor movement is some ways catching on to that and seeing the potential of that and and needs to in bigger and bigger ways. Um, and um, you know whether whether you're looking at just activism and what people are willing to spend their time doing or looking at you know polling data about people's attitudes. Um, and, you know, you can't separate any of those things from the, the context of what's been happening in our country and in our world. So, um, there's an urgency, I think people feel, um, there are things I, I would guess most of us on this call would agree. There are lines that have been crossed and things become precarious that, um, uh, we maybe didn't quite imagine were as vulnerable and precarious, like democracy, for instance. So, um, uh, I, um, I, I think this is also fueling a kind of, um, you know, point of view and level of engagement and activism um, with young people. And this class I have is reflective of that. You know, there are people in this class that have been you know the term salts have salted at um amazon have salted at these are ilr students salted at um uh starbucks um you know they're they're i think there's a a, a wave happening um that is is really uh, exciting and i think the i think students you know when we were students we had a group of labor activists that were mostly white and there was a divestment movement that was mostly led from Ujima and the black student community. And um, one of the better things we did was try to make connections at that point between the JP Stevens campaign, which is about a Southern you know, textile company that was exploiting mostly black workers in the South and the racism there and connecting that to um, the issues around divestment and apartheid. And then we were able to come together and hold what was at the time the largest demonstration on campus since the Vietnam War. Um, I think students now have a more intrinsic understanding of the intersectionality of these um, struggles than we did back then. I see Leslie. Yeah, let's have yeah. Leslie. Hi. Hey, old friend, how are you? Hi, oh my gosh, it's great to see you. <laughs> what a weird venue. It is it is a little weird, but <laughs> we'll make it work. Last time I saw you um, was, it was either graduation or 
you sort of disappeared. None of us knew where you went. I just as a background for everybody else, Al and I went to school together. Hi, Lolly. Um, Hi, Lolly. So, and Al was the president of student government and I was the vice president. And at one point, you just disappeared. We didn't know where you went, but all of a sudden you weren't coming to school. And it was, and then the sort of the, the whisper, um, the whispering began of, oh, he's got this secret internship and he got a job with Al and he's working as janitor. And for the rest of us who had only studied this stuff and, and ILR back in those days was mostly management oriented. Um, so we weren't really studying the union piece of it as much, although we tried like hell. Um, so I just want you to know you became sort of a folk hero to a bunch of us. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have said that while you were swallowing something. Um, but I'm my question for you is, as you have worked through the labor movement all these years, one of the things that is really different now than then, then it was always get people to meetings, get people to, you know, show their, show the masses physically, come, you know, come protests. And, you know, you talked about the J.P. Stevens and um, anti-apartheid groups that, you know, we, we did our best to put together. Now we've got so much social media, we've got Zoom, which on the one hand makes things delightfully easy. On the other hand, I wonder sometimes if it isn't, doesn't make us lazy. Um, what do you see as the most useful way of organizing people in general um, to become active? in this day of of social media yeah i think that's a really important point and discussion and question and again i don't i don't um i don't put myself up as uh a, an expert uh, in in answering that any more than many people uh, that are here uh and i'm you know i'm of a, a certain age right and i i so i'm want to be aware that I may bring some biases to this. I mean, the organization I, I work in now, we're in 50 countries. We we always Zoomed, you know, in order to stay in contact with people. Um, but I, I certainly believe people have to have physical interaction. Um, I think, I think um, you know, if people are going to go through difficult struggle, um, I think things can get built around and augmented and sustained with the incredible, you know, abilities through social media. Things can maybe get sparked uh, the way in some ways, some parts of like Arab Spring were sparked with social media. But I think somewhere in all of that, people have to see each other, interact with each other because they're, they're, you know, people are taking risks. Um, I mean, we're organizing delivery drivers across the world we have a hundred thousand folks we're working with in nigeria they built a they built that hundred thousand largely through social media and a radio station that they control but they also come together and they come together in you know around airports and parking areas in different ways and they they so i i i'm a little old-fashioned i don't think you can i don't think you can build the kind of um true trust and courage without um, a, a, a thread of interpersonal. But I'm amazed at, you know, the efficiencies that uh, of communication. And, you know, if you think about this story, it's ridiculous. I mean, we had, you know, you all know the campus, right? It's huge. It's a city, three, 400 buildings. There's no internet. There's no cell phones at the beginning of this story. How do you just, how do you build any momentum um, you know, uh, across a, an institution of that size. So, I mean, that this story is definitely an old-fashioned story of home visits, time clocks, finding people wherever you can at the grocery store, on the bus, etc. 
um, you know, the person to person. Hi, Colette. Colette is one of the heroes of this story. Um, can you hear me? Now I can. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank you. You know, I, I have to tell you, Al, I, I was so excited to read the book and I was so impressed by, um, by how well you wrote it because you really are as good of a writer as you were an organizer and you were just an excellent organizer. Um, and um, what you've done is really important and it's important for many reasons. It's important for students and it's important for academics, but it's really important that you honored all those people like Emily Apgar and, and I could go on and on and on, you know, people who were just, that was the highlight of their life. And um, for me, I was a clerical worker and I really felt like if I look back in my career and my life there, you know, I, I had a lot of success after the Union Drive. I actually became management. Sorry. <laughs> but um, all the skills that I learned as an organizer helped me to become an effective manager. Um, and um, it was the UAW that believed in me. It wasn't Cornell. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, if I could just add, and, and I know we'll, I'll be quicker on answering questions, um, but um, I just want to uh, add, you know, I mean, um, the uh, organize the, the you know this the part of the story where we talk about the clericals and the texts and the the collective decision to allow service and maintenance to go forward um you know Colette was you know there's something like 1800 2000 clericals on campus and Colette was one of the main organizers ringleaders committee people you know and it's one thing when you're organizing, as you, you you guys all know, and you know, wow, it's clicking. I got a majority signed up on my my time clock, but the organizing among the clericals was so required, so much. You know, it was very difficult to get momentum um, and to to stay effective and persistent and you know strong and positive when the the turf is really tough was what you know Colette and 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 you know many others did and I I I really believe this I'm I I think there's a probably a, a hundred people who went through the struggle who could all write a really good book and Colette is one of them and they'd all bring a different perspective and angle um on on what happened because there were a lot of a lot of stories that aren't told in in the book the way I told it I loved hearing about Peter Tucker, but you know he was he was one of the nicest ones. Yes, really. yeah, I agree. Yeah, he was okay. <laughs> he was okay. Yeah, do we have to have a do we have to have a talk this? sometime. Yeah, that'd be nice. All right, who's next? Judith, can we hear from you? Um, also, thank you. And, you know, thank you for all you've done at Cornell through the years working with you. Um, I was also one of the students there, also a worker at um, a clerical worker for many years as well. Um, I wanted to hear more about um, how you impacted, how you feel that the union impacted um, what, as you term it, the white working class and what kind of impacts it hasn't, you know, in the future now. I haven't read your book yet. And also I wanted to know, I, you know, I'm from California. Um, obviously there was a grad student strike here. That's all UHW. I mean, UAW, sorry, wrong union. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that was pretty amazing what they've done. The, uh, the grad students didn't organize at Cornell. If you could talk more about grad student organizing and uh, also about the impact that had, uh, that uh, organizing at Cornell had on the UAW because, yeah. I mean, it's it is the union that I look at as for grad students now in the future. So, yeah, I mean, there is a an announced grad student organizing campaign on campus um, uh, as we speak, um, uh, and uh, I believe it's a 
they affiliated with the UE, who has organized a couple of major campuses. Um, so we'll see. Um, it'll be very interesting to see where where that uh, goes. Um, you know, we had this interesting experience. I don't spend much time on it in, in the in the book, but um, well, you know, as as you may know, the labor board as as it ebbed and flowed between a Republican and Democrat administrations, one of the first cases that would get flipped was whether grad students were employees and eligible to to unionize or not, and um, there was a fairly long stretch where, you know, the board was ruling that they were not. And during that time, uh, we had built, because of our the nature of our struggles, we had built a lot of ties to students and grad students. And there were some just fascinating grad students. I mentioned a couple of them, especially a couple of the international ones who brought like intense political backgrounds to, you know, unfamiliar to to most Americans. Um, but that created a sense of chemistry and relationships. And then they started exploring organizing and we knew we couldn't get to a, an election. And so I, I thought what we did was pretty creative and it lasted for uh, you know at least, at least a few years um, where we said, okay, you can't, you're not gonna be able to get an election, but you know, there's strength in numbers create a kind of membership. Um, they established a very token amount of dues. I think it was like 20 bucks a semester or something, but they collected it. They had members. They were a branch of our local, of independent branch. And I think they signed up like 1,200 grad students. When that generated enough money, this was our equation as a relatively small and relatively poor local, that generated enough money for them to have a staff person to organizer. So that sustained itself for three or four years without any prospect of going to a board election. Um, and, you know, eventually, you know, leaders came and went, it, it ebbed and flowed and it sort of petered out. Um, and then they've had a few elections that they lost. I've, I've heard stories that they were, I've heard, you know, some negative stories about how well you know, they were staffed or run or whatever, but hopefully uh, this time around the, the atmosphere we're in I think they have a real chance. And there's been so many grad students organizing, you know, it's become normative at so many parts of the country now. Um, so I, I, I think that is critical. And I mean, obviously the UAW has gone through dramatic changes in the last few years. Um, and um, I'm um, impressed with um, the new leadership. It's Part of the work I've done in the rest of my career, part of some of my favorite work has been going in and being kind of there with um, takeovers of, of unions when the insurgents come in. I, I was there with Roger Toussaint in New York and in that kind of moment of insurgency, I was working for the AFL-CIO at the time and I was with the Chicago teachers in their first year when I was with AFT, like some of, some of my... I mean, the local, the, the TWU experience was a little <laughs> insane at, at that point. I can't say it's one of my favorite experiences. The Chicago teachers, one of my all time favorite experiences. It's not easy, um, you know, to come in like that and turn things around. And, um, uh, and I think what the new UAW leadership has on its hands to go into bargaining with the big three after just barely winning elections, it's incredibly daunting. You have a whole bureaucracy that isn't aligned, staff that are, you know, all over the place on what they think should or shouldn't happen. So I have a lot of, I have, I, I was deeply saddened by what happened to the UAW when we chose the UAW, not only was it, you know, big and powerful, but it had a strong progressive tradition. And there was frankly no union that had a stronger uh, 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 practice and policies around ethics. So the idea that that union ended up, you know, with real internal corruption was angering and saddening. And I, I think it's coming out of, of that period now. And um, I think uh, no one knows where it all leads in terms of this strike, but I, I feel like um, they're on the right path.
Rich and Robert have been patient. So I'll ask, um, I'm curious about ILR's role when all this was going on. I mean, you alluded to getting some advice from Jim Gross and I think Risa Leibowitz, but, you know, yeah, they, you know, they Cornell is running this anti-union campaign, you know, and here's this body of experts <laughs> on collective bargaining. Uh, you know, did you feel that Cornell ever consulted the ILR, you know, Frank Rhodes and all those guys ever consult the ILR school? Did, were they you just using management consultants? Did the ILR school ever offer to help? Um, so I, I, I think the ILR school I know the ILR school, it was um, extremely difficult for them to find their footing. I mean, I can say like, hey, what the hell? Like you're a labor relations school, you should have been endorsing and embracing and et cetera, et cetera. But um, they were not used as anti-union consultants at all. Um, and I will, so, I, I think, you know, the, the school was, I think, terrified that they this was going to put them in an, un, a lose-lose position that, you know, labor would be pissed off if they were just sitting on their hands and, you know, they're a small school and a big university and they, you know, they, so I, I also, to be fair, would say, you know, it's disappointing to not have more faculty step forward. We had huge majority of faculty in the arts and sciences college or the human ecology school. They didn't see any problem, but they weren't, they didn't face some of the uh, internal kind of uh, anxiety that, that ILR faced. Um, and, you know, for us, that that was never, uh, you know, as we learned what mattered over the years, you know, we worked our way through what seemed like good ideas that weren't the best ideas to better ideas. I, at some point we realized it's not critical whether a third, two thirds of the ILR faculty are, you know, signing a petition or not. It was nice having a Nobel Prize winner like Hans Bethe say, I'm willing to talk to the wealthiest alumni about this poverty wage problem that that was powerful but that was more powerful than what the ILR school whether half the faculty signed something or not I mean frankly a lot of them were scared and they, they didn't know what to do and there were definitely some like Risa I mean Risa served on a, a commission a fact-finding commission we had been asking for fact-finding you know we, we we felt like we had really strong objective arguments and the university would never agree to a kind of fact finder. And we said, well, then screw it. We'll do our own fact finding process and we'll make it as legitimate as possible. Um, and Risa, you know, was part of that commission and they took in all sorts of data. And she played a, a really good role. And there were, there were certainly many ILR faculty who were sympathetic, but there were even more that sat on their hands. Interesting. I just Think about, you know, you described the early bargaining and grievance sessions and it's, you know, you know people who were jerk supervisors sitting across the table or yeah, condescending yeah. people who, you know, just think they're going to tell you what you want and expect yeah. the workers there are going to believe in the mission of the university and that's going to like feed them, you know, and that here's a body of people who theoretically could sort of tell them how to engage constructively if they wanted to and whether or not they're actually consulted, you know. You know, I one one last like tip of the hat though to ILR. I think I vetted every possible arbitration case with Jim Gross for ten years. It was like this is fantastic. I I always wonder. At one point he's going to say, Al, like go talk to the like the your union rep. It's like, but he was brilliant, and you know he gave me such great. He let me basically. He'd say, No, the case isn't good enough. You need this. You need that. And. Um, it was fantastic. I mean, it was golden. I, and I, you know, he, he'd make some joke or roll his eyes. Like, what are you, what are you doing here again? And I was, oh, I just have one more I want to ask you about. So he probably gave me a hundred thousand dollars of free consulting. Um, 
Wow. I could hear like kids. I had Professor Gross in the in an arbitration, the arbitration course, like really hear him in that arbitration chapter, like him presenting that to us as a case. Maybe we could have that as a case. Um. Anyway. OK, let's have Robert, our last question. Yeah. Uh, Al, in the beginning, you said that you realized that the, the issues facing the employees were similar to those throughout the community. I'm curious what outreach you had with the community at large beyond Cornell to assist in any of the campaigning because. Um, yeah, well, um, there there is a, a good amount in the book about it, and it's, it's mm -hmm. um, some of my you know favorite parts of what what ended up happening. Um, Right. You know, so the, maybe, yeah. the the political. I mean, so there's a, a bunch of things. I mean, if if the biggest employer is paying poverty level wages, it has a huge impact on the economy. <laughs> we actually had small businesses saying, like, God, I hope you guys can get a big raise because nobody has enough like pocket money around here. People are just, you know, squeezed. Right. Um, and. Um, it, it, and then you also have the reality, which is uh, anybody who's around Ithaca who knows has come back up as a major, major issue that, you know, the university is owns half the land and it's tax exempt. And, um, you know, so there in terms of government support and funding, it, it you know, it's it's very challenging. And um, uh, it, so, you know, our. You know, and then other things like housing costs. Um, you know, every mile you get away from the university, housing gets cheaper. Um, you know, so most of the poorer workers are living 15, 20, 30 miles away, have to commute in lousy vehicles and pay for gas and all those kinds of things. And so all those issues, um, uh, the, the, the poverty um, in the community, I mean, Cornell's initial argument was so circularly absurd that it just didn't pass any a sniff test to anybody. They said, "Well, we just pay what the market is here." I was like, "Wait a minute, you're the, you are you are the market." market. <laughs> yeah. Um, 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 so, but the tradition had been, and for those who know Ithaca politics, there was a guy, very nice guy, moderate Democrat guy named John Gutenberger. Um, he was the mayor. He ran the, if you, you remember the IGA, the grocery store yeah. in this town. Um, nice guy, but his idea of town gown relations was he went to the football game and sat next to the president once a year. And that was like a great thing. And um, there was, you know, no assertion of the community's needs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we were, you know, part of a movement to say that that needed to change and um, mm -hmm. that we would not be divided. You know, Cornell would say, well, what do you want us to give money to the community for? That could go into your wages. And we said, we are the community, you know, we're, we're, we're not. Mm -hmm. And and we built, you know, relations with, with other org groups. Um, we, one of the stories in the book, um, mm -hmm. a, a difficult reach for us, Given the, how long ago this was and the socially conservative nature of the of the membership, what, there was a, the the hottest issue in town was a very mild um, anti discrimination ordinance called Local Law C that basically barred discrimination against gays and lesbians in housing and uh, maybe maybe it said employment or something like that, mm -hmm. and that churned up a huge fight. I didn't even know there were evangelical churches in Tompkins County, but People mobilized. The, the county board was split. Um, it was the hottest issue. And um, we were only one of two organizations outside of that universe of, of activism that took a stand on it. And it was a fascinating internal discussion within the, the union. Um, and we didn't, we just you know, thought if we're, if we're really going to be a progressive union and be a leader in the community, we can't you know, we, we're not going to get involved in every issue, but we maybe this is one we shouldn't duck and we should at least try mm -hmm. to see if we can work our way through it. But what the unintended consequences of that were, I can't tell you how many other fights we had where the gay community um, felt like that they had our backs. 
in, in, in countless ways. We didn't do it because we thought we were gonna get something back for it. It just seemed like there was an important issue that we didn't wanna just sit on the sidelines of it's sort of a right and wrong issue. And so, you know, it's a small town. Those relationships yeah. got built <clears throat> across a lot of different um, issues. So um, I just one more footnote. Whatever happened with the unemployment insurance? I was just, I, I hadn't heard that. Is there an exemption that Cornell can control its own standards? Well, the the language is if you have, let me see if I can remember, um, a, it's something like a, uh, not guarantee, but you, you have, if you know you are going to be reemployed, you have a, like a written guarantee you're coming back, you're not eligible. That's what I sort of refer oh, to it as a oh, loophole. Okay. Okay. We didn't realize at first the university was self-insured. We thought, oh, this is Byzantine, complicated unemployment insurance. They're one, one for one. So, you know, we literally could have bargained something like a supplemental unemployment insurance, or we said, you know what, just don't give them that that letter. And then they don't have a guaranteed uh, return. We, you know, they're coming back. We know you're they're coming back. We'll figure something out around it. We were open to any kind of creative solution. Set up a separate little fund or something. Um, but they were never um, okay. They were never you. interested in that path. Thank you. Okay, great. This has been awesome. This was so interesting, and it's very interesting to hear from people who were there with you in school, and have been very involved in labor in various capacities over the past decades. Really, really thank you so much for joining us and for sharing the book with us. Yeah, thanks guys. It's great um, to see you and it's really wonderful to see folks I haven't seen or names I haven't seen in a long time. And um, um, I, I hope you enjoy it. it uh, you know, um, I've learned a lot about the publishing world. And the first thing my friend Bill Fletcher said to me was, you know, you're not going to make any money doing this, right? And I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not expecting to. And boy, was he right. Um, uh, so I am I am donating what are uh, the meager portion that goes to the author um, back to the a local hardship fund. So when I when I encourage you to buy the book, it's not for my my um, yacht. Um. <laughs> uh it's, it was also good to hear from the people that were part of your pro your campaign from way back. So I, yeah. I'm glad yeah. they got on. Thank you all. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Al. Sorry, I was driving. Yeah. Have a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Okay, great. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night.